Hello once again. It's good to be back. Today we've got what I hope will be a very, very interesting topic, but very different from what we've had in recent sessions. Uh, there's going to be no deep and profound theory here. Uh, this is a very, very practical session. I assume that rabbis need to know uh, the essentials, uh, foundations of kashrut, and need to be able to use those essentials to actually make some reasoned decisions uh, about the conduct in synagogues, in homes, and so forth. Uh, I, like you, am well aware of the fact that our education here at JTS does not include many of the details of kashrut. Uh, I assume that most of you have picked this up either in your earlier educations or since. But that being said, I think that there is a way to boil this down to essentials, no pun of cooking intended. And uh, with those essentials, actually, we will be well prepared to judge most matters of kashrut, not simply uh, by reference to the written letter of the law in a book, however valuable that is, but these are principles that will allow, actually allow you to work with the law uh, and make decisions that I think are far more flexible uh, and far more intelligently informed than a simple reference to the book uh, would lead you to be doing. So uh, I've chosen mostly, quite simply, Gemara from Chulin. And since, uh, while, yes, it's true, the animals that we eat and the way they're slaughtered is an important part of kashrut. It's not for us an important part of kashrut, by which I mean there are very, very few, if any of us, who are going to be going into a slaughterhouse and making judgments about the kashrut of an animal, whether it's slaughtered properly. What matters to us is what happens in the kitchens in our synagogues or the kitchens of those in our communities. So uh, in that connection, it is mostly, though not exclusively, the matter of milk and meat that I'll be addressing. Uh, this will have implications for related areas of kashrut as well. I've asked you to look at a Mishnah and related Gemara in the eighth chapter of Tractate Chulin. Uh, and I'd like to jump right into this because I think that these are matters that require uh, a little bit of careful learning. We're not going to have time, obviously, to learn this in detail, but I think we can draw attention uh, to the essentials. The Mishnah begins uh, with the declaration that all meat is the same, essentially. Kol basar asur levashel bechalav, chutz mibsar dagim vechagavim, the exception, the meat or flesh, probably a better translation, uh, which would not be counted in the broader category of flesh or meat, is the flesh of fish and the flesh of grasshoppers or other similar such creatures. But this, of course, uh, would imply that fowl, that's what we're going to address first, is in the broad category of meat, like the flesh of cows or the flesh of sheep uh, and so forth. Uh, and this becomes the beginning of an important discussion in the Gemara on 104a, near the bottom. Amar of Yosef, Shmamina, Basar Of, Bechalav, De'oraita. Would we not learn from this Mishnah, says Rav Yosef? that the prohibition of mixing the flesh of fowl, chicken, turkey, um, with milk is a prohibition from the Torah because the Esau Kedatach de Rabbanan, if it were not the case that it, the prohibition comes from the Torah, then Achila Gufa Gzera, then the prohibition upon eating, right, actually eating, uh, the flesh of chicken, say, with dairy, would be a gzera, says Rav Yosef, because it's not prohibited from the Torah. It would be a rabbinic addition. Right? You have to worry about fowl because it's sort of like other meat. Um, so this itself would be a gzera, rabbinic enactment. Va'ana nigzar ha'la atu achila. And would we make a secondary enactment, gzera, for putting it on the same table because you might eat it together where eating itself is a gzera? His assumption is, although we know, those of us who know rabbinic tradition know this isn't exactly the case, but his assumption at the foundational level is uh, that you shouldn't make secondary gzera. You make one gzera, one fence, as it were, around the temple, and you don't extend beyond that. That's just going too far. 
Um, so he suggests this. The Gemara comes in and proves that you're not allowed to make a gzera to a gzera. Um, and then responds and says, you know what? It's actually different from the case which is emblematic of gzera to gzera. Why? Because, the Gemara says, this is uh, five, six lines down in Amud Bet, Isharit leila suke of gvina, if you permitted him to put on the same table uh, fowl, chicken, and cheese, then he would readily put meat and cheese on the same table, and thereby eat uh, flesh of a prohibited animal, not merely uh, a chicken, but you know, bona fide meat, uh, with uh, milk prohibited by the Torah. Uh, and since the slip from one to the other is so easy, this needs to be considered not as a double gzera, as two steps to protect the law of the Torah, but as really one step. Now, in response to this, and this is the important point for our discussion, we've now got a follow-up objection. Mat kiv la rav sheshet. Sof sof, sonen bitsonen hu. He says, even if this is correct, that in effect it's only one step of distancing transgression, one gezera, nevertheless, we're still dealing with a case here of tsonen bitsonen. The meat is put on the table, the assumption is cold cuts. Uh, the uh, cheese is obviously also cold, so you've got cold with cold, and this, he says, the prohibition of eating cold meat with cold cheese is itself a gzera because, and now listen to Rashi's explanation, this is clearly the pshat, it's clearly what is assumed uh, in the objection uh, just articulated. Rashi says, Achila gufa de Rabbanan. Eating cold with cold itself would be prohibited only de Rabbanan. That is to say, if you want to make this very practical, take a piece of kosher cheese, put it on a piece of kosher pastrami. Right? The Torah, in the rabbi's opinion, says Rashi now, would not prohibit that. Why? Daha sof sof tsonen vitsonen hu. You've got cold with cold. And even eating them together cold with cold, so there would be no prohibition here from the Torah. Why? Now the important point. The only thing the Torah prohibited, as the rabbis understand it, is if it was cooked first. If it's cooked, then you're not permitted to eat it. If it's not cooked, then the Torah doesn't prohibit it, only the rabbis. Now, the Gemara goes on to resolve its problem here, the immediate problem, the way it does, and I don't want to address that, although it's important to note that the Gemara assumes um, that a kli sheni, right, that is to say kli rishon, is the vessel that something is cooked in. If you pour it out from there into a second vessel, that's called klisheni, and uh, the assumption of the Gemara is that klisheni doesn't cook. However hot whatever is in it might be, a klisheni doesn't cook. This would have all kinds of implications, both for kashrut law and Shabbat law, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. The important thing here is our recognition that um, anything beyond the prohibition of eating the milk and meat which has been cooked together, anything beyond that is merely a rabbinic prohibition, and everything else in the system needs to be evaluated on that basis. So, for example, when the question of separation comes up, we have to recognize, I mean, this is a question of separation, that it's the rabbis erecting boundaries here which don't need to be erected. They're creating symbols of separation. If they want, they can create a symbol of separation, keep it separate on the table, or don't put it on the same table. That's the only thing the Mishnah talks about. The Mishnah, for example, never talks about waiting, because waiting between one and the other might be a symbol of separation, but it might not be. You don't need it in order to have the law of the Torah protected. It's the Gemara which raises the question of waiting between one and the other, as you've seen in this Gemara, uh, but it does it in a rather complicated way. It begins um, with the discussion of a principle offered by Agra Chamua, the Rabbi Abba, who says, Ofuk vina nechalin bapi korn, the bottom of the same page. Hutani lava hu amarla, what does this mean when he says that fowl and cheese can be eaten with abandon, quote unquote? 
uh, he explains it. You can eat the two together without washing the hands in between and without wiping out the mouth in between. Um, this is rather a liberal principle, and the story that follows, which will be important for us uh, in Tosfot, um, actually uses this to object to a case um, where um, in, in the house of Rav Ashi, um, cheese was brought first and then meat was brought second, meaning bona fide meat, not, um, not fowl, uh, and he ate the meat after the cheese without wiping his uh, mouth, without washing his, well, more specifically, without um, wiping, washing his hands. Of course, in their day, they're not using knives and forks. They're using their hands to eat. So they're really talking about their eating utensils here. That's the technology of eating. You have to make sure your hands are clean because it is with your hands you touch the meat and with your hands that you touch the cheese. That's where the danger of mixing occurs. Um, in this first step, and supported by Hill and Shammai, Beit Hill and Beit Shammai, it's clear that the only thing they imagine here as being relevant is washing and wiping. Order seems not to matter, as Tosfot observes, because they use a text which teaches meat, that's in this case fowl first followed by cheese, to object against a story, a case where it's um, the opposite, that is to say where you've got cheese first and then meat. They don't seem to regard this as a crucial factor, though the Gemara later on does, and this is, of course, why this is so difficult to Gemara. Uh, as you go on, you see that the question of waiting is finally raised on 105a. Um, the first stab at it, interestingly, asks how long do we need to wait between eating meat uh, and then eating cheese? The first answer is not at all. Uh, the Gemara objects and says, wait a second, don't we have a tradition which teaches that this can't be the case? And so they reverse um, and say, well, if you eat cheese first and then meat, the answer is not at all, but if you have meat first, then you've got to wait. We all know this. But then the question is, how long do you have to wait? Pause for a moment and recognize that waiting is not essential in any way unless, you'll pardon me, this is a joke that I, whenever I've taught this, you know, a joke, not so funny, but um, whenever I've taught this, I've remarked that if your mouth is so hot that when you put the two foods together, you would cook them, um, then we might have a problem here. But unless your mouth is so hot that when you put your um, finger in, um, it's scalded, because that's the definition of cooking. If you put your hand in something and it's scalded, anything less than that doesn't count as cooking. So in fact, the orita, as we saw earlier, you can take the meat and cheese, put it in your mouth, no problem according to the Torah, and the rabbis might choose to symbolize separation some other way. So if you want to eat one and then the other immediately, in theory, the Araita, there's no problem. Yet they search for waiting as one possible option. We'll get back to that in a moment. And the um, measure that's given here, um, the bottom line measure, is what in the Gemara's language is su'udata achrita, another meal. And the question is, what is that other meal? There are different traditions that put this Gemara together. Uh, and those traditions, which are, are, are actually at the foundation of all later Jewish practice, um, Sephardi practice concentrates on this principle of su'udat achrita as it is interpreted by Maimonides, who the physician that he was thinks that the relevant factor is digestion, uh, and he suggests six hours, which I understand to be not a dafka measure, right? Nobody has a clock to look at, but a rough measure between one meal and the other, the morning meal and the later afternoon meal, but six hours is what sticks there. Ashkenazi practice, following the toast vote here, actually goes in a very different direction. Um, you saw, uh, what's crucial here, is Rabbeinu Tom's uh, interpretation. Uh, and Tosfot interprets this quite, uh, or repeats this quite at length. Rabbeinu Tam Mefaresh, Fekein Halachot Gedolo, so two major sources support the same interpretation. Da'achal basar, asur le'echol gvina. If you ate basar, the halacha is, you are then prohibited from eating dairy, gvina, cheese. But what does that mean? Hainu b'lo netila v'kinuach. That means that if you don't have the means to wash your hands and wipe your mouth, you left your toothbrush somewhere and you have no water to wash your hands, then you have to fall back upon waiting, right? But, aval, the netila v'kinuach shari. 
If you wash your hands and wipe your mouth, you don't have to wait at all. According to Rabbeinu Tom, that's the halacha, which this Gemara suggests. Um, so when it says, you know, if you ate cheese, you can then eat uh, meat, that means you can go and do that immediately without washing, without wiping, fine, no problems. And now, Umar Ukba, Delo Achil Ad Suuda Acharite, Mar Ukba, who waited till the quote unquote next meal, what does that mean? That's either Hainu, Baloniti Labakinuach, either he was in a position where he had no means to wipe his mouth and wash his hands, Inami, alternatively, Machmir Alat Mohaya, maybe he was just being stringent. He didn't have to do it, but he decided to do it anyhow. Um, and then the discussion goes further. Um, and he indicates that there is a clear practice uh, not to eat cheese, not to eat dairy uh, after meat, despite what's just been said, or meaning you've quote-unquote got to wait, but waiting means to the next meal. If waiting means to the next meal, we have to go to the next host vote, which addresses this question of what's the meaning of the next meal itself. The answer is, l'sudata achrita, lav b'sudata shirigilin la'asot, it's not talking about the kind of meal that we're accustomed to doing, Achad shacharit v'achad aravit, one in the morning and one in the evening. They did not eat three meals throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. It's we who have the luxury of eating three meals. Ella, afilu l'altar, even immediately. Im silek hashulchan, if you removed the first meal. Uverach, all right, and said your birkat amazon, um, or potentially it means the blessing at the beginning of the next meal. It doesn't matter here. Mutar, it's permissible, the low plug rabbanon, the rabbis did not, there's a halachic principle, the rabbis did not make fine distinctions. In other words, he understands that the Tosafist behind this comment understands that the next meal means symbolically the next meal, not a period of time, but at the same meal you don't eat meat and cheese together. At the next meal you do. How do you know when it's the next meal? By the rituals that define the end of one meal and the beginning of the next. So if you finish at what we would call a fleshic meal, say Birkat Amazon, start a new meal with whatever blessings are necessary. Even if it's only 10 minutes later, you can then eat dairy, according to Tosfot. This becomes Ashkenazi halacha, um, this is called, quote-unquote, one hour, but one hour doesn't mean one hour. One hour in the sources which discuss this means, you know, as soon as you go on to the next meal, if you want to be machmir, wait one hour. Um, the crucial point, though, is that up until the 16th century, Ashkenazi practice clearly uh, was one hour, uh, and only then under other pressures and circumstances changed to the custom that we know. So this is the consequence of our recognition that the prohibition of the Torah is only if it's cooked together, you need therefore hot with hot, if it's cold there's no cooking, and therefore literally massive parts of the system we call kashrut. Uh, you will recognize how this applies to waiting. It also applies, as we'll see in one moment, to separation of dishes. Um, all of this is unnecessary as the rabbis understand the Torah. They demand certain things, uh, but if you look at the sources, the things they demand are actually quite minimal. Now. Um, the second very, very important extension of this, uh, and I'll do this briefly given the limitations of the time, um, is, uh, I mean, we all know, you know, for us, kashrut is as much as anything else, the map of the kitchen, right? Where are your fleshik dishes? Where are your milchik dishes? How many sets of them do you have? Uh, and so forth. Um, you know, if, if you're really good, committed, and in our fashion, wealthy, you'll have at least, I imagine, eight sets of dishes, right? That is to say, uh, common and uh, special uh, weekday and Shabbat, uh, you know, and then do the same thing for Pesach. In any case, uh, maybe that's a little bit extreme. Um, but where does this all come from? The Gemara never heard of separation of dishes. It did know that under certain circumstances, a dish or a pot, more likely, could present a problem, but it never heard of the notion that there should be a comprehensive separation. The foundational discussion is on 111b near the bottom. The, the other source that I asked you to look at, itmar dagim sha'alu bika'ara, right? If you have fish which were put in a dish, right? Rav amar asur lochlan bakutach. Rav says one is prohibited from eating them to, in a kind of milk, you know, a dairy 
uh, and I don't even know how to translate it's like a sour milk that they ate at their meals. Ushmul Amar, with bread, I might add. Ushmul Amar, mutar lachman bakutach. And Shmuel says, you can eat it with this dairy dish um, in order to fill out the case. And none of this makes sense unless we go with Rashi, who says that the fish themselves um, were uh, roasted or cooked um, and taken hot. He says, kishayu rotchim, they were taken hot and put into this dish, a dish which itself had been used for hot meat. That's the crucial thing. So you've got fish, which itself was still scalding hot, put in a dish which had been used for hot meat. And the question is, the hot fish put in the dish for the hot meat, can you take this fish and then eat it with dairy? Right? We'll recognize the problems. I think it's fair to say that most of us would say no. Right? This is not something you can do. There is an argument here um, between Rav and Shmuel. Rav says no. Shmuel says yes. Their dispute comes down to a dispute over a principle, a principle which some of you may have heard of, but which unfortunately is no longer effective in the practice of the law. So many of you actually may not have heard this. It's called Notein Tam Bar Notein Tam Dehetera. Um, the Gemara uses this language. Uh, if you prefer, um, uh, the slang for this is not bar not. That's the Rashi Tevot. Um, what does this mean? Um, if you have one transmission of taste, so from the meat to the pot, then you remove the meat, clean out the pot, put in water or put in dairy, you've got a secondary transmission of taste from the pot to the, that which is now being cooked in it, right? That is no tain tom, bar no tain tom. And as this text goes on, we get to the bottom line, and the bottom line is, in the name of Abaye, hilchata dagim sha'alu bika'ara, right? The case discussed here, hot um, fish put in a dish which was, had been used for hot meat, Mutar lachlan bekutach. That fish can be used for dairy because he applies the principle of no taint tam bar no taint tam. That is a lived principle as far as he's concerned, and throughout until the 16th century, um, and then it came to be compromised very significantly. What are the consequences of this? Well, it applies to permitted food with permitted food, where the only prohibition is when you put it together. So none of this applies to. Um, to pig, for example. We're not talking about ham uh, being cooked here. We are talking about uh, dairy and meat. And what it says is that the laws that apply to the mixing or cooking of dairy and meat are far more lenient because of this principle um, than the laws that apply in bona fide prohibited foods. Uh, what that means is if you have an immediate passage of taste from one of these foods to the other, you've got a problem. If you've got secondary transmission, you actually don't have a problem, even though we don't practice this way anymore. What were the consequences of this? I want to read to you the Shulchan Aruch and even Israelis um, to see how liberal the law was based upon this foundation, even in the 16th century. Israelis says, this is in the Shulchan Aruch, section uh, 95, uh, you know, paragraph 3, um, Arot uh, basar. if you've got dishes, what we call fleshic dishes, Sheutchu, which were washed, right? They didn't have dishwashers. Their dishwashers were large, um, you know, cauldrons, pots, uh, which had boiling water in them. So if you had uh, fleshic pots, which were put into a boiling kettle, um, which itself was milchik, Bechamin shayad saledet behem, and the water there was hot enough to cook, Afilu shnehen b'nei yoman, even if both of them been, had been used on the same day, right? The dishes were used for one on the same on, on the same day. Um, the pot in which they're now being cleaned was used on the same day. Mutar, this is all permitted. Mishum tahave le no tain tam bar no tain tam dehetera, because this is a case of this secondary transmission of taste of permitted items. Now, uh, it's fair to say that we would never consider um, this permitted. Um, you might say, well, wait a second, maybe Ashkenazi tradition was more stringent. And in fact, there's a long comment of Israelis here um, where he does say that Ashkenazi uh, practice was more stringent. But listen to his bottom line. He says, um, though a prohibition is dafka shehudchu b'yachat, right? The Ashkenazi prohibition is only if they're actually um, boiled together. Uvachli um, rishon, right, in a uh, cooking vessel. Aval, if you have milchic and fleshic dishes, 
which are cooked, which are put in the same pot, right? or in a second um, dairy vessel, the hot, hot water, but not the one that they were cooked in, even if you take milchich and fleshik dishes and put them in this together in hot water, right? But not in Kli Rishon, he says, um, it's all fine, right? No problem at all. It's mutar. And then goes on, aval. Im ira maim rotzchim, she'enam shel basar, velo shel chalav. Right? If you take boiling water and pour it over milk and fleshic dishes together, right? But what it was boiled in was your tea kettle, which is neither milk or fleshic. Al kelim shel basar v'shel chalav, beyachad afilu shomen dabuk bahen, even if they've still got some of the fat from the meat stuck on them, um, hakol shari, right? All of this is permissible. Why? De'ain irui kakli rishon mamash, because pouring out from the boiled, you know, the, the tea kettle, as it were, is not the same as actually putting it into the boiling water. Um, what he's describing here, if you will, um, if you look at the text, is um, our case of the dishwasher. Um, what he's saying, in effect, is, uh, and uh, it, it's utterly unambiguous, um, you can use a dishwasher sequentially from milchik and fleshik without any hesitation whatsoever, so long as you make sure there's no actual meat um, in the bottom of the dishwasher. Um, under those circumstances, there's no problem at all. You can go on, you can look at the source. Needless to say, we would probably not judge that way, although I know there have been some interesting discussions here in the law committee. Um, the idea is this. We've got a living principle here which says, you know what, this has got to be relatively speaking lenient um, because, in fact, the prohibition uh, of milchik and fleshik going back to the Torah is only if they're actually cooked together. Uh, and it's hard to get to that state. There's a lot more to be said here. I hope that uh, you will uh, both appreciate these principles and find ways that you can apply them. You'll pardon me for um, selling from out of the store, as it were, um, but if you want to look into this in more detail, uh, let me recommend to you uh, what I have discovered to be by far uh, the best, the most detailed book on Kashrut, intelligent, balanced with some of the development history that I found. It is none other than an art scroll publication, uh, Binyamin Forst, Rabbi Binyamin Forst, The Laws of Kashrut. Um, if you want an excellent reference for Kashrut, um, this is the one to go to. Um, there is none better. Uh, if you have any questions or any discussion uh, of what the implications of this might be, I look forward to discussion online.